So we're going to record and we're going to live stream back it up for our next keynote speaker, uh, Galaxy Hornick. Um, who is a new member of Ne'er Shalom. We're so excited that their family has come and joined our community um, or that their portion of the family has joined the family that was already here uh, to be part of and um, is part of our community. Uh, Galaxy has a master's in environmental studies and a JD. Um, and so I'm so excited for them to come and talk about the Jewish values of environmental justice. The, um, our uh, materials went out before I had their official title. So their official title of the of this talk is mm -hmm. Tukun Olam, no, is oh. environmental justice. I left it your title. You remember I sent you an email back. Oh, it's okay. All right. So we're going to talk about environmental racism, uh, policy and justice. Um, and yeah, so thank you for joining us, Galaxy, and take it away. Sure. Well, thank you for asking me to talk. Let me see if I can get this going with the share screen. Mm, which thing is that? Probably this one. Mm, click on that. And then, wait a minute. Do you see the presentation? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We can also see everything oh, else good. on the screen. Where is that? Where is it? Give me a second. I'm just getting this set up. Mm -hmm. Play, play slideshow. Now. Now I wait, is it still sharing? No. no. Okay. <laughs> share screen. Does that share? Okay, now oh there you go. That's it. Okay. So <clears throat> the rabbi sent me this title, Environmental Racism, Law and Policy. Um, and so I basically just built the presentation off of that title to, to give it a structure and some kind of direction. Um, it's still fairly broad. I mean, in, environmental justice, say, give a talk on environmental justice is kind of like, give a talk on mechanical engineering. Mm, it could be more specific. So it could have been lots of things and this is just what I did with it. So there could be other questions and that's fine. Uh, first off, what is environmental racism? And what I have here is that environmental racism happens when environmental degradation disproportionately impacts communities of color. So that, that's basically the, the problem. And then I've already used the word, but basically the answer to environmental racism is environmental justice, right? What is environmental justice? Well, we have a Virginia Environmental Justice Act as of a little over a year ago. Um, and according to Virginia state law, environmental justice means the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of every person, regardless of race, color, national origin, income, faith, or disability, regarding the development, implementation, or enforcement of any environmental law, regulation, or policy. So we're talking about everything. When you talk about environmental law, regulation, and policy, that's, that's the whole thing, right? Um, but if, if you look at it, it's, it's the fair, not just the fair treatment, right? Because you're worried about disproportionate impact. And so you wanna make sure you don't have that is if you have, uh, I guess, a more proportionate impact, then that would be fair treatment. But notice for environmental justice, it's not just that people are not disproportionately impacted, there also has to be meaningful involvement. 
you don't have environmental justice unless the community being affected has been involved in the decision making process of developing the policy or the law or the regulation. Okay, so that's basically in environmental justice. How did I get to be so interested in this basically goes back to where I grew up. Um, Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, I lived in a neighborhood that was uh, predominantly black, maybe 70%, maybe 67% somewhere in there. Um, and everybody else was maybe first or second generation. Um, and the uh, railroad tracks went right behind our house. Right. So we had an amazing amount of uh, noise pollution. And most people think about noise pollution coming from traffic with sirens and whatnot. Uh, but we had noise pollution coming from the train to the point where uh, you remember, well, some people remember uh, when you used to talk on the phone and it was this thing that you would hold on to like this. And then there'd be a train coming and you can hear it coming a while away. So you say to your friend, uh, hold on, there's a train coming. I'm not going to be able to hear you. And then you take your phone away and you're just like waiting. You're like, hold on, hold on. It's almost past. Okay, right? <laughs> I mean, that's just how phone calls would go. Um, and then I put earthquake question mark. This was, this is an environmental impact as much as noise, but I put question mark because it's not literally an earthquake, right? But when you're, you're sitting in the house, and all the dishes are rattling in the china cabinet, <laughs> right? The, the lampshades start moving and stuff. If you were in California, you would know for sure that you were in the middle of an earthquake. But if you're in Wilmington, Delaware, then you know that the freight train is going by, right? So that was an environmental impact that happened because you know, the train went right through the uh, neighborhood there. Um, air pollution, of course. Well, okay, what's on the trains? It's a variety of things because it's a uh, freight, freight train route, but there was a lot of coal. And the coal would go in these open bed coal cars. So they, they it had a bottom and sides, but there'd be no top and they're just full of coal. And if you think about it, trains are, I, I don't know if you've ever ridden the train, it's a little bumpy, right? And you could think that for coal, they don't care. Like people, they put in shock absorbers, coal just gets all the vibrations. Well, that kicks up all the coal dust to the point where, I mean, if you're trying to, for example, mop the living room floor that, you know, I, I, I had to do growing up and there's this coal dust and I'm trying to get it clean and I know I'm not getting it clean. I'm getting it cleaner. And eventually my mom says, okay, okay, it's clean. Just spread it out, make it even so it looks right. Like there's nothing you can do. Everything's covered in coal dust. That's just the way it goes. The, I mean, asthma in that situation is a super common occurrence, right? I mean, you think little kids, how the heck would they find out what asthma for? Well, because a lot of the people have it. That's how they know what it is. <clears throat> Water quality, that was another issue. Um, there's been a lot of conversation. I want to say it was maybe a few years ago when everybody was talking about uh, trying to get people to drink less soda or put maybe putting a separate tax on sugary drinks and whatnot. And how can you convince people not to, not to drink soda? Okay, I can tell you growing up in a place where you could read in the newspaper that the water quality was the worst in the nation or the second worst in the nation, but we were always placing pretty high in that uh, category. I, I, I didn't drink water because you have to be a fool to drink water. I drank soda because it was readily available and it wasn't like the crazy stuff coming out of the tap, right? So that was another, uh, piece of environmental degradation that was just layered on top of the noise and what I was calling the earthquakes and the air pollution. And then you get situations with the uh, built environment where um, 
<clears throat> our neighborhood needed another uh, another fire department, uh, another uh, fire station. And the city was looking at where to put in the fire station. And they said, oh, hey, look, here's a piece of cheap land. Let's put the fire station in right here. And the whole neighborhood had to rally together to fight against it because where they were going to put it was across the street from a neighborhood park. And now I in the 70s, this might seem a little disjointed, but I grew up in the 70s. So I'll just admit that right now. In the 70s, kids actually played in the neighborhood parks and they could go there by themselves or with their sibling. So you'll have children randomly crossing the street back and forth to go play at the playground and go home and use the bathroom or get something to eat or whatever, right? If you're having a lot of children randomly crossing the street, that's not a good place to put a fire station because a fire truck's gonna pull out of there as fast as it needs to pull out of there at random times. It's only a matter of time until somebody gets run over, right? So we won that fight, they put the, the fire station somewhere else. But that's another environmental factor that would have put another burden on that community. And so you can see how part of what environmental, just, environmental justice is about is not just that it was a minority neighborhood, but it was a minority neighborhood that had these multiple layers of environmental degradation that they had to contend with at the same time. And they have kind of a multiplying effect. Okay. Okay. So that's basically what in environmental racism is, is the disproportionate impact of environmental degradation on communities of color. And environmental justice is uh, how you kind of fight back against that. And what I thought I wanted to do now, uh, maybe Rabbi controls the breakout rooms, I think, is that right? Um, yes. If we could do some breakout rooms just for maybe like five minutes and um, people could try to identify instances of environmental injustice from your own life experience. They just five minutes to try to brainstorm what you've seen with your own eyes kind of thing. Okay. Uh, hold on. Yeah, there we go. I can't even see my mouse. All right, you should be able to join breakout Everyone's rooms Everyone's left me and my mouse cursor disappeared. That's not smooth. <laughs> oh no. Hey, everybody. Do you? Ha, I'm back. Okay. okay. <laughs> We're in breakout rooms. Oh, I can't Are hear you. Are you going to join one? I can't. You can't hear me. Hold on. I think Era took the laptop that had the volume on it. <laughs> oh my God. Hold on a second. Okay. Uh, let me mute myself so I can be loud for a second. <laughs> uh. The, the development just outside of my little development has a sod farm. And I believe they use a lot of chemicals to grow just grass and not weeds. The way the land is situated, when it rains and there's runoff, that a lot of that pollution comes into a stream that goes halfway through my little development. And there's a lot of erosion and there are chemicals and people kind of got together we don't have an hoa but the people right on either side of that little stream kind of got together and tried to see if there was a legal way that we could approach the sod farm people because they did approach them about the extreme runoff and the chemicals and 
nothing came of it because they did check it out, but they said the sod farm people wouldn't make a holding pond. That's what they wanted them to do to help with the with the erosion. So that's I guess that's an example of um, injustice, pollution injustice uh, that we're experiencing. All bougie, and you go around, and yeah, it's clean. The sidewalks are clean. It doesn't smell like pee or anything like that. And you walk back a block to my apartment building and you can just smell it all. Yeah, so that's one example. I have one example um, from my life um, of environmental racism. Um, in my hometown, uh, the city was building the public housing communities, which is essentially where people can live if they aren't able to provide housing for themselves. And they were nestling like three or four or five different communities all right next to each other. So it ended up being like this huge section of town that was just, you know, public housing communities and essentially uh, you know, lower income families, um, which there's been a lot of research to show that nestling everybody together like that just creates um, lack of opportunity. Um, and there's better ways that it, they like spreading the communities out across different uh, areas of the community so that they're all, not all you know, like segregated almost in one area is a smarter approach. Um, and it was very obvious, you know, there were other areas in my hometown where there were just, you know, communities that were one off and sprinkled around. And you could see that there was a very different look and feel and culture um, in this one where there's five public housing communities all nestled together versus, you know, one that was sprinkled here or there and then another somewhere else. And so that was very apparent that that was um, having a negative impact. I know. Maybe I should add something. I don't think if, I don't think the five minutes we, we have is enough, but <laughs> Just to add a little bit to the topic, um, I am the Water Quality Programs Coordinator for Soil and Water Conservation District. And recently, EPA selected me to be part of the justice, equity, and diversity inclusion with the uh, around water quality monitoring. And doing what I'm doing in Prince William County, I started as a volunteer. I was born and raised in Cameroon, and I studied in Sweden where I had my master's degree in environmental science. And more, what we were taught was to be able to analyze the environment and try to solve problems that are in the environment. So when I moved over to the US, I saw that the county streams, they needed more attention. And I picked the, the, the branch of water quality to try to, to apply all the techniques that I've learned in promoting sustainable development. And that is what made me to be doing what I'm doing. But being who I am and where I came from, uh, I, I, I equally experienced some sense of environmental injustice because um, a lot of folks, they could not imagine somebody like me coming to a space where I have not grown up in and proposing that I can do this, I can help the community to do this and that. So it was a big struggle. And a lot of folks, even though I was a volunteer, there was this force behind it that what I'm trying to propose is going to fail, but it didn't. And from a volunteer, I became a contract worker, a part-time worker. Today, I'm a full-time worker. I have had an, I now have an assistant and the program is growing really strong. So this is something that, you know, environmental injustice is something that you experience regardless of where you are. But one thing we must carry with ourselves or have in mind 
is that aspect of believing in yourself. You will always find that regardless of wherever you are, where you come from. And that's just a little thing I would like to chip in because of the time frame. Thank you. Because I was moving Zoom rooms, I kind of lost track of the time. Did it is uh, did everyone get a chance to share, or does anyone else want a chance to share before I close the rooms? I think we're we're running up on time here, Rabbi. Okay, great. Thank you. I don't know, Carl. Do you have anything to share? No, and I I don't have yeah. anything to add. I, I I'm sorry, but I can't follow Veronica. <laughs> yeah, that was a great. <laughs> That was a really amazing story, my friend. Yeah. Everybody's coming back. So maybe unmute somebody from different groups and we can see what kinds of environmental injustice did you find? Hello, uh, our group uh, mentioned um, uh, finding um, streams that were in, in need of um, environmental care. Um, and I think she said Prince William County and um, Sim mentioned um, humans defecating on public sidewalks in certain neighborhoods and and right. I mentioned um, um, over um, public housing projects that were um, that were numerous and nestled um, so close that um, it was creating complications for the community because of the density of the housing uh just that it um a smarter approach perhaps would have been to sprinkle the and actually what virginia does is like they they provide low-income families with apartment subsidized apartments and that gets you know the families all in different types of neighborhoods where you know the community i gave the example of was like building these public housing neighborhoods and there were three or four of them and you know the fact that they were all collected there you know just created a um uh, a neighborhood culture that had some problems all right let me see anybody else de facto housing segregation thank you rabbi yes you know, de facto housing segregation is um, tangential to what my master's thesis was about because, uh, okay, I'm going to do a quick aside just because you said de facto housing segregation. Um, Brown versus Board of Education, the country found out that they were going to have to integrate was in 1954, Brown to 1955 or six um, said, no, yeah, we really mean it, right? And then um, 1956, though, was um, the Eisenhower did the uh, the first federal highway act. So people found out that they were going to have to integrate at the same time that they found out that they were going to have an interstate system. And so they built this interstate system and started building suburbs with covenants that said you can never sell this house to anybody but a white person, right? And so the entire, essentially the white community just moved to these whites only suburbs. And it took a few more decades before that kind of thing ended up getting struck down in court. We had a civil rights act, all that stuff, right? Um, but by 1972, uh, Swan versus Board of Education was a case out of Baltimore where the Supreme Court said, you all are killing me. You have to integrate. Okay, I'll tell you what, buses. You're gonna bus kids if you have to, 
to get them to integrate, right? But by that time, the, and I don't remember the exact number, maybe off the top of my head, but the interstate system was like 75, 80% complete and essentially no progress had been made on integration, but progress hadn't been made on integration largely because white people used the interstate system to build whites only suburbs where they could all move and not have to be near anybody. And so now, hey, the neighborhood school's integrated. Anybody who lives in the neighborhood can go there. Just happens to be a whites only neighborhood, right? Okay, so yeah, housing segregation is, is deep and serious in this country. And at this point, I mean, the country is more segregated than it was before Brown versus Board because of the interaction between Brown versus Board and the development of the interstate highway system. Okay, that's the aside. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Amy mentioned uh, some sod, a sod farmer near there. I think that was the predominant. I mean, I mentioned living in uh, in different communities all over the country, um, being near to indigenous communities and the problems. And I listed three in particular. Um, I mentioned the gas pipeline in Kansas that went through native grasslands and yeah. uh, the monarch, uh, the, the milkweed and monarch population there, the, the monarch butterflies, which are huge pollinators. Um, I mentioned the Puyallup tribe in, and well, I didn't mention all of the tribes, the Puyallup, the Nisqually and um, tribe, those two tribes were impacted a lot, but the Puyallup tribe won a years long case uh, land use stuff, which was a, a victory. Um, in Washington state and uh, um, they also won some reparations due to the water quality, the water damage that done, had been done to them due to the pulp mills um, in the Puget Sound and how that impacted um, the fish, their fishing. Um, and then I, and I don't, it was long ago enough in my life that I don't remember a lot of the details. And then the most recent um, were friends that I had when uh, we, li I, we lived in Albuquerque and they were Diné, um, also known as Navajo. Um, and um, uh, uh, the nuclear power plants um, uh, in Four Corners uh, and in the New Mexico, Arizona region and how the babies were literally being born with organs outside their body. And um, there were severe birth defects and miscarriages um, due to uh, nuclear waste dumping. But then Amy had a recent uh, and local concern regarding sod farming. Regarding what? Sod farming. Yeah, my development is is next to a sod farm and the water runs down and the chemicals and the runoff are uh, eroding a, a little stream and it's all falling into um, Cedar Run uh, stream. Oh, geez. And we talked, to, I, did, I wasn't involved, but people talked to them and asked them and investigated to see if there was anything legally and there was not. And they just said, the sod farm people said, no, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. Oh, my goodness. So that's, that's not as major as, as the other discussion, you know, what the other examples were. But it's just a minor. Well, that issue. could, I well, mean, it's not that minor. Who's downstream, you know? It just depends not, who's yeah, downstream. It's not birth defects. You know, that's, that's so major, yeah. Well, just so you also know, every golf course does the exact same thing as sod farms. They dump tons of chemicals every year. Mm -hmm. It all washes into the water. This has been going on for since the 50s when yeah. they learned how to take care of grass. Oh, my God. Golf courses are a whole other thing. I don't even want to talk about golf courses. You could teach a semester-long class about what's wrong with golf courses. <laughs> okay. Was there, that's a lot. Did we miss anything? Okay. 
what's this chat? I just noticed it. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Close the golf courses. There's a great, by the way, um, Malcolm Gladwell podcast called Revisionist History. And there's an episode called A Good Walk Spoiled. And it's all about the legal nonsense around golf courses in California. You think, oh my God, if they close the golf courses, they'll never have financial difficulty again. Anyway, okay, on with the show. I will share screen. There it goes. And then, okay, era left, but I think you all can see the screen again. <clears throat> we did the breakout. Okay, this is a cool map. Um, I put the, the URL on the top. It's mapping for ej.berkeley.edu slash Virginia. This is a cumulative in, impact map of Virginia. So the green is less impact. So dark green, you would expect to not really find any environmental justice impact there. But that kind of orangish color, the brown color, uh, the darker it is, the more environmental justice impact you would expect to find there, right? So uh, it, it's a cumulative impact. And that's what I was talking about when I was talking about the uh, neighborhood that I grew up in. And I listed maybe half a dozen different environmental impacts that we had to handle at the same time, right? So you would expect that, especially the, the darker, I still don't know what to call that color, brown or orange, something like that. Anyway, the, the darker orange ones, you'd expect to find uh, the concentrations of people of color at the same time as having many layers of environmental degradation at the same time that they have to handle. And when you look at the state of Virginia, I mean, you can see that, you know, the Southwest has a lot and South Central looks like there has some and then it looks like going up along Interstate 95 uh, through Richmond and up towards DC. Um, but what I did was I zoomed in on this map. And by the way, check, go to the website, check it out just sometime. It's, it's great. Um, I just pulled seven maps, I think, from it. It's not nearly all the fun you can have. So here I zoomed in on our area. And you can see the cumulative impact, the cumulative environmental justice impact in our area is in Manassas, and then it gets darker, meaning more intense as you move into Manassas Park. And then at the kind of the bottom middle of the screen, kind of the south part, that's about where triangle is. And so you get a lot of environmental justice impact around triangle and then moving north along the interstate 95 corridor. So in those two areas, Manassas and north into Manassas Park, and then triangle and moving north along the interstate 95 corridor, those are gonna be the areas where you're gonna to expect to see um, the concentrations of people of color at the same time as you're having multiple types of environmental degradation. Okay, so the next map, I just kept the same zoom because I thought, why not focus on our area? The next zoom is, where do the people of color live? The, as you go to darker blue and then especially darker green, it's more and more where the people of color live in the area. Uh, as you go lighter blues, and then fading down into the super light blues, you don't expect to find nearly as many people of color living there. So once again, the biggest concentrations are gonna be in Manassas and then especially moving north into Manassas Park where it's darker, right, uh, green. And then from that triangle area, 
moving north along the Interstate 95 corridor, there's a lot of the darker shades of green. So that almost perfectly matches that previous slide, which makes sense, right? Because that's what you'd expect. How are you going to have environmental justice impact if that's not where people of color live? Now, it's interesting to see it match kind of so perfectly, right? Because you would think, well, wouldn't there be some places that wouldn't be like that? But I don't know, maybe because I have it zoomed in on a local area, you don't see that as much. Let me see. I'm just looking at the chat. Talk about systemic racism. Yes, absolutely. That's. I noticed you have peoples with hands up, Galaxy. Oh, I can't see that somehow. Maybe I'm on a wrong part of screen here. Let me go to a different part of screen. I still can't see hands. Can you see oh, people? Juliet, I can see Juliet with a waving a real hand. I saw go Peter ahead. Kemmel earlier and Sarah um, earlier. I don't know if they're, I, th I think Peter, uh, Juliet's literal hand is raising, but I think Peter had a, a hand up and Sarah as well. Okay, well then let's go Juliet, Peter, and Sarah. Go ahead, Juliet. If an item that has been in the news, local news a lot lately, is the new gaming resort that they're putting on top of the landfill. Mm -hmm. I, reading the articles, they're closing the landfill 10 years before it's expected to close. They're not saying it's because it's full. They're just saying it's closing 10 minutes before they were planning to close it so they can put this huge gambling resort on top of it. And this really bothers me because I don't know where the trash is going if it's not going into the landfill. Um, I understand about the economic impact. It's creating jobs. It's keeping gambling money in the state that was going to Maryland, but some, some dots are not being connected here for me. Do you know anything about this project? And, and I don't know that project in particular, no. No, but it's not surprising, <laughs> right? Yeah. Peter, you still have something? I actually didn't have my hand up. Oh, Sarah? I'm muted, sorry. Um, so I was trying to do a little bit of Googling real quick because um, I can't for the life of me remember the name of the town. Um, but the concentration of uh, environmental justice problems there specifically down by Quantico is specifically related to the pyrite mine that existed um, down by Quantico, um, there was a, let me unraise my hand now that I'm seeing it, it's uh, bothering me. So there was a, a free woman, um, I wish I could remember her name for heaven's sakes, it's going to drive me crazy, I literally learned it yesterday, um, living there before the start of the uh, um, Civil War, a freed woman of color who was living there, um, and at the beginning of the Civil War, the pyrite mine, and specifically the pyrite and the sulfur in the mine became very valuable. Um, and mining uh, picked up significantly. Um, and a lot of folks moved onto the land um, that this, uh, this woman had there down in Quantico. Um, so a lot of folks moved there as a place to be safe and as a place to be free and as a place to have a job. Um, so, and again, a railroad running right through there, a pyrite mine, um, which obviously um, tremendous environmental impact right there, right? Because you're, you're melting, um, so you need coal in there, um, dumping slag, dumping uh, rock into the creek there at Quantico. Um, they're just now starting to uh, recover. I think they started the project something like in 1994, like very recently trying to recover from the uh, environmental devastation that that whole mining project wreaked. And that obviously 
that the mining itself hasn't been happening for decades. Um, but you still see a lot of the, the remnants of the uh, population uh, distribution because of that mine itself, where people lived there, where the railroad was that went through there, um, and why why they lived in that in those particular spaces, and why there was such a tremendous environmental impact through that through that space. I'm trying to look at my notes. I don't think I have it handy enough. I to, can't for the oh, life yeah. of me. That me. has something to do maybe with the Marine Corps Combat Development Command area. That's at Quantico. That might be yes. what you're. Is it super fun site? So it, this this is in the Prince William County Forest. Okay, yeah, I think it overlap. It, it might overlap with that, or maybe this is a separate thing. The the Marines have. It was I don't know. It was a thousands of acres, and in oh, yeah. 1993, it was put on the national priority list for super fun. Yeah, because they 19... just they coat everything with lead. If <laughs> the military right? base is well, basically full of lead. <laughs> well, military has a lot of environmental challenges. And oh, yeah. I mean, just think if, if they're even just testing ballistics, they they want their ballistics to be stable enough that it doesn't blow up before you get rid of it, mm -hmm. right? Because you don't want to be carrying it and have it blow up. But then they want it to be unstable enough that when it smacks into something, it will explode, right? And so you're trying to gauge, balance that line of how explosive is something. So when they're testing things, sometimes things don't explode and they're just sitting out there. And then whatever, whatever chemicals that explosive was made out of are then going to end up in the groundwater, basically, yeah. right? I mean, yeah, um, military land has a lot of environmental issues. And I know there are people working, working on it. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done. But this, when you were talking about Quantico, it, it reminded me of this thing that I found that was the, the marine land around Quantico mm -hmm. that became super fun in 1993, put on the national priority list. In 1999, the Navy identified 228 sites within that property that needed to be investigated and possibly cleaned up. And as of now, they're working on the first five of the 228 sites. Sounds 30 about years right. later. Military yeah. speed. <laughs> oh my God. 30 hey, Galaxy, years later. I, I noticed you have some more hands up. Uh, Brandy, and Veronica. Why can I not see the hands? Okay. Oh, I can see them now. Okay, Veronica. Um, just to add a bit um, to the pirate mine at Prince William Forest Park, I did my intention internship with the National Park at that forest or in that forest. If you go um, on um, any waterway above the pirate road, if you have the opportunity to scoop a little bit the stream bed, you will find pirate particles. You know, in that area of the stream, just an input to the pirate mining in that area in those days. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Maybe and... somebody can explain what pirate pirate is. That's the first thing. And then what I wanted to add about Quantico, uh, also, I think sometime in the last 20 years, they had an underground oil, uh, I think fuel tank that was leaking and that leakage was pretty ex extensive. Eight years ago, the, the fuel tank still had not been repaired. And if you go to the Stafford County Public Library, you will find the env environmental impact study. Um, and, it's, and it's at the library so that people can go in and find it and be aware that there's like been fuel leak leakage near these lands. Um, so that's interesting. That, that might be the leak that I read about when I was reading about the marine land and the most recent kind of, they, they check in every five years as they're working on this super fund. And they said, yeah, we, we have this, this uh, plume of pollution in the uh, groundwater 
um, somebody really needs to map that and figure out where the boundaries are. And I was like, 30 years later, how are you going to find boundaries? I mean, of course you can find boundaries, but you have to think you've really lost control of this thing at a certain point. Oh, now I have lots of hands up. Let's see. Uh, let's do Carl and then Sarah, and then I'll go back to the slides. I just going to point out alongside your map that you had up, there's four contaminated sites I'm aware of around here. The GAO office south of Springfield Mall, Harry Diamond Labs in Woodbridge, Quantico, of course, and the research facility across from Jiffy Lube. That one they just capped and they're tearing out all the buildings after 20 years. They were a research facility that had contaminants in the soil. And they line up with the map you had up. The other part I was going to say was the map you also line up had a lot to do with compressed housing causing contamination because it's cheaper. I mean, right. that's where people live who don't have a lot of money in the cheaper housing. And those houses are usually kept closer together. That's the nature of economics. Where I right. happen to live, uh, we have to have our houses further apart because we're on well and septic and Prince William now requires, well, back in the day when this house was built, it was an acre plus for well and septic. Now I think they require four or five acres. So the houses have to be spread further apart. So your map lines up with compressed housing as opposed to also with contaminated sites as opposed to people who are in individual houses. Right. Yeah. Sarah? All right. So <laughs> pyrite. Pyrite is uh, iron sulfide. Um, it's mined for its iron and for its sulfur. Uh, it's used in glass, soap, bleach, textiles, paper, dye, medicine, sugar, rubber, fertilizer. Um, and generally the mining of it is pretty simple because it's shiny and looks like gold. And then they, you know, uh, melt it down into its component parts and it's pretty terrible for the environment. They uh, dump the slag all over the place and nothing grows. Um, and the name of the town is Bates Town. Thank goodness. Oh my goodness. And that was just I, I gonna believe pyrite is also known as fool's gold. Fool's gold. Yes, is, it's yeah. it's shiny. So, it looks like gold. <laughs> it looks like gold, except it's um not it looks crystallized more than gold. So like it's got facets rather than luster. gold. It kind of tends to be smooth. It's, it has a luster. Yeah. It's lustre in shape. <laughs> Geology is um, my undergraduate i love geology you and me veronica we're going to be buddies i, I can just feel it uh yes. but bates town was named for sally bates a free freed slave and then so you've got this gigantic population of people that kind of moved in and clustered around that neighborhood um and so you've got a, a, a high percentage of population living there it grew to something like 550 residents and supported a church and a school on the land that was uh, Prince William Forest Park around that mine there. All right, cool. All right, I'm gonna go back to sharing the screen. Okay, we were looking at, okay, yeah, this is the people of color map. Diesel particulate matter in this area. The darker green, the more diesel particulate matter there is. And you can see, yeah, it's in the whole area. Like there's not a lot of real light green, but the real dark green, where that means the biggest concentration of diesel particulate matter in the air is that area around Manassas Park and from Triangle North along the Interstate 95 corridor again. Right, so that's, people are breathing that. Um, there's a lot of stuff in the air. There's uh, regular particulate matter that gets um, described by size. So you might hear, might hear uh, 2.5 particulate matter, for example. Um, but usually uh, there's a category that's just kind of a catch-all category called air toxics, and that's this next map very similar, almost the same actually, as the diesel particulate map. But this now is the air toxics map. And this comes 
I mean, some of it comes from transportation, but a lot of it comes from industry. And these are gonna be a bunch of chemicals with long names that you'll never remember anyway, and they're just floating in the air and you breathe them. And can you lower yeah, the map? Say again? Can you bring the map down about two inches? Uh, or don't, no, don't you, have anything, you don't have anything above Manassas Park? Uh, oh no, I can't move the, the map. I just zoomed in on that area and then I just did a screen capture of, of the map from the, the website. But I put the website at the top there, uh, mapping for EJ. Uh, hopefully you all will go explore it because I'm just kind of scratching the surface of what's on the, the website with a half dozen maps that I grabbed. It's um, also in the chat if people wanna just click the link. Oh, the, 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 reason I, the reason I was curious is in the Manassas Park lineup, you're in the direct uh, lineup for Dulles Airport landing because they come mm -hmm. right over my head every day. Same thing up right. 95. That's another approach for the aircraft going up to uh, Washington Airport. Right. So uh, it Reagan, puts another layer. That's another layer of environmental degradation on that area, right? Okay. Uh, it's where the air toxics are. And then, hold on, let me, why can I not? Well, anyway, I'll just go to the next slide here. I think Ozone. Brandon might have another question. Oh, go ahead. I was, I was curious why that one little area is white in the midst of the greener area. And it's maybe, I'm thinking maybe that there's just no data for that area. Yeah, that's a no data spot. Yeah, that's all that is. Uh, the ozone here, I put this in because it, this one, and of course these all make sense as to why the pollution is where it is, right? So the ozone is worse up towards DC. It's not quite as bad here. It gets a little better as you move uh, southwest away from DC. You can see the dark green to the medium green to the little bit lighter green. And this one is not um, uh, concentrated correlating to people of color at all, right? And so the reason why I put this in is because you're gonna get somebody sometimes in these presentations where they're gonna say, you're just showing all the pollution around the people of color, trying to pretend like white people don't have to deal with pollution. And it's like, well, no, hold on. That's not even the point at all. This shows that certainly uh, there's a, a more equal distribution of a particular type of pollution, but what the white areas, the, the areas populated by white people don't have is the layering of nearly as many types of environmental degradation that they have to deal with at the same time. So they, yeah, sure, the ozone is the same, but if you're in an, in an area that is more populated by white folks, then you don't have nearly as much of the diesel particulates. Right? You don't have nearly as much of the air toxics and on down the line. And those things add up the kind of combined effect of trying to deal with multiple uh, modes of environmental degradation at the same time. Here's the adult asthma map, okay? The, the dark blue moving into dark green is a more of a concentration of asthma. And you can see the blue up around Manassas, but especially Manassas Park. And then you can see a lot around Triangle and moving north a good bit along the Interstate 95 corridor, right? And some of these spots, uh, if, if they're, uh, you can kind of see the key in the lower right corner. So it, I feel like they didn't pick their colors that well because the the no data box is this gray that looks like it might be a low concentration. So it's a little bit hard to tell, like, was that a no data spot or was that a low concentration spot? But you can definitely tell that um, the adult asthma uh, incidence correlates a lot with the uh, concentration of people of color living in the neighborhood, right? Okay, let me see if I can, ha ha, I'm figuring out my technology. Okay, um, so 
trying to figure out how do you approach dealing with these situations. Oh, wait a minute. Is that a hand up, Brandy? No? Yeah? No? Okay. Um, start with policy. A big picture plan describing general goals. That's all it is. I mean, policy sounds maybe like it's it's a little fancy, but it's not really. It's just, so what are you going to do? We have federal policy at the federal level, the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969. This was the most sweeping environmental law ever passed, passed with bipartisan support and signed into law by that left-wing radical Richard Nixon. Okay, maybe not a left-wing radical. Uh, but the policy is to create and maintain conditions under which man and nature, because it's the 60s, right? Man and nature can exist in productive harmony and fulfill the social, economic, and other requirements of present and future generations of Americans. So that's basically the, the policy is that we want to maintain that productive harmony. Now, it takes society a long time to come around to things because if you have equal protection of the laws and you have the National Environmental Policy Act at the same time, you'd think you'd have environmental justice covered. Turns out it's not that simple. We have state policy as of less than two years ago. <laughs> um, the Virginia Environmental Justice Act happy to have that as a milestone. We have an environmental justice law. It is the policy of the Commonwealth to promote environmental justice and ensure that it is carried out throughout the Commonwealth, right? That's the policy. The state of Virginia says, we're gonna promote environmental justice. And Prince William County, uh, the, um, uh, board of County Supervisors in the last year or so uh, passed a sustainability initiative. Uh, strategic plan includes goal five, um, environmental conservation, whose goal statement is to promote and expand the preservation and protection of natural resources and processes and promote environmental justice. So, I mean, that, that counts, right? All you have to say is and promote environmental justice. Let me see, this mouse is weird. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I can see that there's a chat, but I can't get my mouse to go over to it. So let me see what it is. Simcha said, um, truckers have to deal with lots of air, diesel, and other pollution just because of the types of vehicles they are using. And they also have a larger proportion of uh, people of color that are truck drivers um, because of systemic racism and job gaps, which then makes an even larger gap in the environmental racism. Right. True. Okay. I was going to do a breakout here, but I'm looking at the time and I think maybe uh, because we're having so much discussion um, that I don't necessarily need to do a breakout. I was going to say, write a policy that would avoid a situation like the environmental injustice that you identified in the previous breakout session. But I think we're having a good conversation. I'm getting a little bit behind schedule. And, um, you know, the policies that we've seen already have been pretty general, right? Just promote environmental justice. It could be as simple as that. So the last uh, section is um, law. <clears throat> Laws are rules that help us achieve our goals. Now, I, I put the note here that historically law hasn't helped much with environmental justice because the environment isn't specific and because we have a pay to play legal system. Okay, I'm gonna take that in pieces. We have an adversarial legal system which means that if you're harmed, then 
you can take the person who harms you to court and you go head to head, right? There has to be, you're, you're going to have to argue specifically what that person did and how it was your harm is their fault, right? It has to be super specific. It can't have been like, well, I think it was, or maybe it was, or uh, mostly it was, right? Well, what's the environment? I mean, think about like, how would you define the environment? It's your, it really, because I did a whole paper on it in law school, really? It's just your existential negative space. It's everything that's not you. It's the environment is the opposite of specific. And the legal system is really designed to handle things of a very specific nature and handle them in a very specific way. So before the National Environmental Policy Act, all we really had was nuisance law. And there were some really good things done with nuisance law, but it's not surprising that it wasn't adequate, right? And then when you have a pay to play legal system, sure, you can, you can sue somebody if you can afford to sue somebody, right? I mean, at the very least, even if you don't hire an attorney, which I don't recommend if you're gonna do that, but even if you don't, you're still gonna have court, court costs, right? It's, it's not free. So, and the more complicated a lawsuit is, the more expensive it's gonna be. And then maybe the other person can just outspend you until you can't afford to stay in the game anymore. So there's, there's no surprise that our legal system didn't address environmental justice very well. Okay. I'm gonna track this the same way that I did um, policy, we go federal, state, local. We had federal law, the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969. Uh, what did it do to carry out that policy? We got a couple of things. Uh, we got the Council on Environmental Quality that is in the executive office of the president. The executive office of the president is huge. It has all kinds of advisory people in there and whatnot. And the Council on Environmental Quality is part of it. Um, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act also uh, gave us environmental impact statements. So the Council on Environmental Quality, if you were to read the law, and I didn't want to get too deep into the weeds with it, but they have a lot of responsibilities. Uh, in hey, terms Gal, of sorry to interrupt, yes. but I, I noticed that you have some, some questions happening in the chat there. Okay, give me a second. Um, the Council on Environmental Quality has a lot of responsibilities in terms of advising the president, tasks that they have to do. And environmental impact statements are just, um, anytime uh, federal money is gonna do something or a federal actor is gonna do something that could affect the environment, you need to have an environmental impact statement to assess the situation uh, as part of um, the kind of buildup to determining whether or not that can happen. And there's public review and it gets into a, I, I don't want to put anybody to sleep, but okay. Questions. I don't see hmm, the way that my screen is. I'm not seeing the questions, but maybe Ver people could just ask. Veronica asked, what, what did you say? There was a previous law um that you mentioned maybe wilson law what was it called no the previous law was nuisance law nuisance okay yeah Thank you. yeah if um if something's being a nuisance to you then uh before 1969 that would be a, a reason to to be able to go to court and seek a remedy to get somebody to stop you know, it could be pollution or who knows what. Okay. Are there other ones? No? Okay. Yes. Already. Yes, there are. Okay. Um, in the chat, it also says, oh no, um, that was it. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> 
I guess my technology setup isn't all the way the best because I can't see some stuff, but it might just be me not knowing how to use it. Okay. We have other federal law, the executive order 12898 of February 11th, 1994. Bill Clinton um, has uh, signed the executive order on environmental justice. Now, executive orders, it, he's basically talking to all the federal agencies, all the offices that work for the federal government and saying, you got to deal with this. And what it, it's several pages long. It has a lot of details. And I just took this clip from kind of towards the beginning of it. Each federal agency shall make achieving environmental justice part of its mission by identifying and addressing disproportionately high and adverse human health or environmental effects of its programs, policies, and activities on minority populations and low-income populations. That's another big mouthful, but here's um, what was a big deal. That they had to, he told the federal agencies that they had to identify and address disproportionate effects, disproportionate impact. Because historically, if you try to complain about racism um, in these kinds of things, you get told, well, uh, there might be a disproportionate impact, but you know, uh, they didn't mean to do that. They weren't trying to do that. There was no plan to do that. And if you don't have the intent, then you're, you're not going to make it very far. And this, this shift in the uh, legal discourse to start considering disproportionate impact uh, was a really big deal. And this was uh, Bill Clinton telling all of the federal agencies that they, they have to start thinking about that. Yeah, but I can't even see the mouse cursor half the time. I don't even know where that sucker is. That's okay. Okay. Uh, okay, federal law. I did NEPA. I did Executive Order 12898 for environmental justice. There's a huge amount of environmental law. I'm just going to give you those two as examples. State law. Virginia Environmental Justice Act of 2020. Uh, that's done a few things over the last little more than a year. We now have an Office of Environmental Justice in the Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, we now have an interagency environmental justice work group. And a lot of the ideas in the Virginia Environmental Justice Act largely mirror uh, Executive Order 12898 in terms of you have to think about the impact which I think only makes sense, right? I mean, I, I saw that, and this is kind of off topic, but I saw the other day an interview with uh, Stephen Colbert, and he was talking about, the, the, the interviewer asked him, because he's the one being interviewed, asked him a question about cancel culture. And I'll, what did he, the way he said it was really kind of funny, but he said, something like, it might be a little solipsistic to think that the intent of your work is more important than the effect of your work. Like, really? <laughs> like, you don't care what actually happened in the world, it's just whatever you were thinking in your head is the only thing you care about? That doesn't make any sense just from a perspective of trying to be a person interacting with other people. You're not gonna make it very far if you're that self-absorbed, right? So looking at impact over intent, I think was just very overdue. All right. And then it, there's this thing, um, attorney general opinions. So people who are in, for example, uh, state legislature or state agencies might have questions about the law and they don't wanna do things the wrong way. 
So they'll submit a question to the attorney general to get an opinion and say, hey, answer this for us so that we do stuff the right way. And there was an issue where um, uh, under the Virginia Waste Management Act, somebody was gonna get a, a permit for a, a landfill. And the question was, do we have to consider environmental justice uh, when we're giving out a permit for a landfill? And, and the attorney general opinion um, said that the Environmental Justice Act not only sets forth uh, a policy of the Commonwealth, but also imposes specific enforceable duties. I have the whole text on there of that section. Um, therefore, the director must ensure that environmental justice is carried out, right? So it said, yes, yes, you have to follow the law is basically what the attorney general said. So they're like, really, do we have to? And it's so funny. If you go and look up Virginia attorney general opinions, there's a page of all the official ones and you can see the questions that people have asked. And you thought, why are you asking these questions? Like one of them, somebody asked, can Virginia repeal having voted for the Equal Rights Amendment? And the attorney general was like, no. And Galaxy thought, why are you asking? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Anyway, um, after the Environmental Justice Act passed, of course, very quickly, there was a question, really, do we really have to do that? And the attorney general said, yeah, it's the law. You have to do that. Prince William County law, that sustainability initiative that I was talking about in the policy section, um, it created within Prince William County an Office of Sustainability, a Sustainability Commission, and a Community Energy Master Plan and Sustainability Plan that's really focused on climate. I mean, it's focused, it has a broad environmental mission, but there is a lot of focus on climate because well, climate's a pretty pressing issue right now. <clears throat> okay. I was going to do a breakout here to see if people wanted to write a law to implement the policy. Do you want to practice? Let me see. How am I doing with the time? Oh, gosh. I'm almost over. I have 15 minutes. Well, I don't really have... That's essentially the end, it was gonna be a breakout and a discussion, or we could just do a discussion if people have enough questions. Galaxy, I would love it if you would speak a little bit more about the concept of pay to play and like the challenges of an individual consumer um, or a community in actually addressing environmental um, issues in their community. Like, how does that, how do you combat that as an individual? Like, how do you get, how do you bring someone to, to court for something that they're doing that's hurting you? You mean now that things are a little bit better or what was the challenges before now? Now, like if I needed to address something now in my community, what would I do? <coughs> well, um, there is a little variety of tactics that you could take. Um, one is you could, well, it, it's almost hard to talk about in the abstract, um, because lots of situations get handled a little bit differently, but oftentimes there will be a government agency that's supposed to be regulating the situation but they're not regulating properly. And there's gonna be a way to hold them to account, right? So they might have within that agency a way for you to file a complaint, probably a way for you to appeal. It probably gets to the point where they said, we answered your question, we're not dealing with you anymore. At which point you have to actually file a lawsuit and say, hey, this agency isn't doing their job and it's, it's hurting me, right? Um, 
the, I'm trying to remember the name of the nonprofit. Maybe it's the Center for Biological Diversity. Maybe. Anyway, one of the environmental nonprofits is hugely successful in just systematically almost suing the government to make the government do its job. And you, you have an uphill battle when you go into court against the government, right? Because first you have to make sure that you have a right to sue, right? Um, but then you get past that hurdle and it turns out that the judge is gonna say, I'm not an expert on all this scientific environmental stuff. I'm really just an expert on the law. So the judge is going to say the science is whatever the government agency says it is. So when you sue the government for over an environmental issue, you're stuck with the government's perspective and assessment of the situation. But, and I don't even know what to say about this. Uh, these lawsuits have been hugely successful and made an enormous difference in mitigating environmental injustice in the United States because the different government agencies are literally not doing their job even on their own terms. It's ridiculous. But those kinds of lawsuits are, are successful. Um, oftentimes, it, it's still gonna cost money, right? So it, how do you, as a person, you don't necessarily have the, the scientific expertise, the legal skills, you know, even, even if you went to court and said, hey, I'm poor, I need a waiver of court costs. And even if the court said, fine, you can sue somebody without having to pay money. But you're, that's not having to pay money to the court. That doesn't count things like, I mean, I don't know who is the person who's wanting to do this. Can they afford all of the postage that's involved? Um, can they afford... Uh, or have available to them expert witnesses that they're going to need. Even if the court's not charging you, even if the attorney's not charging you, it can still be amazingly expensive. So oftentimes, uh, a better strategy is to try to get a nonprofit involved. And there are a lot of uh, nonprofits, uh, social justice oriented and environmental oriented, um, that have essentially legal departments that deal with that kind of thing. And they can they can take the case on for you. Okay. Is that a good answer? Veronica also has her hand up. Oh. Yeah, Galaxy, I, I would like to add a little bit. It's not in the direction of suing, but what I did in Prince William County that I got the program running. When I noticed mm -hmm. that uh, most of the streams didn't have the attention it needs, I wrote to the Soil and Water Conservation District and the manager told me to write a project to present it to the board of directors, which I did. And I offered to volunteer to, 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 to do what I say, you know, like to volunteer to start the work as a volunteer. And when I started it, you know, as a volunteer, gradually, they saw that what I was saying is an area that really needs attention. But now as a volunteer, you know, it was getting more attention. And at one point they thought about my compensation, whereas there was no budget, you know, to pay me in what I'm doing. So the, at the start, they had money to support me as a contract worker. But at the same time, since my work is related to the county, because actually what I'm doing, my office needs to be in the county government office, not in with the soil and water. So the county now offered some budget to support my program. So my money actually comes from the county, even though I am with soil and water. And the most amazing part about it is that I didn't even know because at one point, EPA had to assess the county's environmental, you know, when it comes to water and all the issues we have in Prince William County. And they have a section for water quality, which was missing. 
And at that meeting, all the things that I've been doing, my newsletter, those were the things that were presented, you know, as what Prince William is doing in this direction. So just to share a little bit, you know, the approach that you can take to bring some of those things that worry you in your community to the attention of others. Thank you. No, that's great. Yeah, I mean, it, obviously you have skills, right? Because you have to be able to do the work in the first place to, to be hassling them. But yeah, a lot of times, well, okay, not a lot of times, but sometimes uh, somebody will just take a personal interest and it becomes emotional for them that they want to pursue that. And, you know, they, they have the skills and just keep sending letters to the right people and documenting the right things. And, and you, you can make progress that way. I remember, I don't remember the person's name, um, but she was a guest speaker when I was in graduate school. She wrote a book. I want to say it was the person who wrote Making Better Environmental Decisions. Anyway, uh, they were trying, I think they were trying to fight a logging project. And you know, there's all these, I mean, piles of documents that have to be in order to get something like a logging project to go ahead because of all the in, in environmental considerations. And she was a random citizen trying to fight this thing. And she would go to hearings and she would figure out what the rules were and she would read the documents and she was causing enough of a trouble that she actually ended up with a meeting with uh, some of the, a couple of the corporate people who were in charge of the company. And she pulls out some of the, the documents from the, the case. Um, and the people from the logging company saw that her copy of it was written all over. Things were underlined, circled, notes in the margin, arrows going different places, referring to different, anyway, it's just a matter of uh, getting an emotional connection to where you want to sink your teeth into it. And really, you're, it's what you want to do. And then you end up with this work product, right? And they, they <laughs> she said no, but they offered her a job. They, they saw her work product. They saw her copy on the table that she was working from. And they said, wow, that's, that's great work. You want a job? She was like, no, I want you to stop logging in my backyard, you know? But yeah, that's often a, a, a route to uh, success is if you have the time, energy, and skills, you can do that. I'm looking at the chat for a second. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think that was all old and I just didn't see it very soon. Yeah, there's nothing new in the chat. We have about five minutes left for, for last questions. Um, and then we'll, we can continue. We have a half an hour until our next speaker. So we can continue the conversations. I will open um, breakout rooms and, um, you know, if, if folks, have specific requests of things they'd like to spend the next half hour talking about as well, um, let me know. Okay. I just wanna say thank well, you. I think I found this like very uh, interesting and inspiring, um, especially <laughs> the whole comment about uh, the, the soda tax um, knocked my socks off, like legitimately <laughs> talking about systemic racism and not even knowing it when you're in it. Like my whole ethos has been like, hell yeah, tax the soda. Like, because I work with the little people for whom that's problematic, right? Is drinking soda. Right. And why wouldn't you make it more expensive for their parents to, and it never in my wildest dreams would I have occurred, would it have occurred to me to tie that to something like Flint? where drinking right. the water is not an option, right? right. And how, how incredibly naive of me to be like, oh, soda's bad. Well, yeah, 
except if that's the only thing that you can drink that mass. So excuse my language. I'm sorry. I get a little bent up about stuff like that when it's <laughs> when it sneaks up on me and surprises me like I appreciate you opening my eyes to that. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's the best when it sneaks up on you because then you really learn it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not just Flint. I mean, I, I lived in Wilmington, Delaware, and they had terrible water. Yeah. Simcha has their hand raised as well. Oh, Simcha. What do you say? I actually exited out of Zoom because I had to move it to my phone. Um, but I would like to have a little breakout session, just maybe like five minutes for anyone who wants to do something active bit. Oh, yeah. you want an environmental activist breakout session? No, I mean active, like physically active. Oh, physically oh, active. Like an <laughs> action. Oh, like you're tired of sitting there staring at your Zoom screen. <laughs> you need to do calisthenics. Um, maybe not that. <laughs> <laughs> stretching something yeah okay i believe calisthenics is just an old person word for stretching simple. i thought calisthenics was I like jumping was... jacks and more like heart rate <laughs> more aerobic related. yeah that's aerobic stretching is not necessarily aerobic you don't get your heart don't rate be up ageist on my calisthenics <laughs> <laughs> oh i'm i'm not being ageist i'm just teasing my spouse <laughs> calisthenics is muscle training like you're like training your muscles to move in a certain way no oh, it's okay you can make fun of me i always joke about yoga is just calisthenics for hippies <laughs> maybe gal can teach us how to juggle oh goodness <laughs> maybe in person um rabbi you said the next session is it in half an hour at 3 30 Yes. Um, I thought it was four, our, but okay. No, our final session of the day is at 3.30 um, with Aaron. Hold on, I don't, I don't want to mispronounce his name. Aaron Tolson uh, from the Virginia Food Rescue, Northern Virginia Food Rescue. Um, so for right now, I'll go ahead and